Part 6 of Beyond Good and Evil is ten sections long and covers about twenty pages in the Kaufman translation. Its main focus is the character of today's modern philosophers and the character of the coming philosopher of the future. Nietzsche diagnoses a harmful shift in philosophy, a dangerous neglect of experience. Scholars are declaring independence of all hierarchies, but this amounts in their case to a kind of self-glorification, such that the scientific men are now trying to dictate to philosophy itself. There is a general atmosphere of contempt and lack of respect for philosophy, which Nietzsche thinks has opened the gate for the instinct of the rabble to enter the halls of philosophy. He especially indicts the positivists, positivism as a kind of lack of belief in philosophy itself, and notes that modern philosophy has fallen very far. Now, as mere epistemology, as theory of knowledge only, it possesses no dominating spirit. It cannot serve as the engine or driver of any new culture or any new creation of values, any new synthetic view of the world. He refers to philosophers who over-specialize as dilettantes or millipedes, and he argues that philosophers should be giving a strong yes or no to life and to the value of life, and that by the standards of today, the genuine philosopher will seem to be imprudent to take wild risks with himself. Today's scholars, Nietzsche says, have traded fruitfulness for respectability, and so they have all the virtues of this type of person, industriousness, a patient acceptance of their position in life, along with a moderation and sensitivity to the needs of their equals, of their class of mediocre people. He notes that this type of scholar profoundly wants an affirmation of his own value and his utility, a sort of constant reminder or refresher of the social usefulness of his work. Nietzsche says this is a remedy for his a psychological defect, for this kind of self-mistrust which infects this mediocre sort of soul. These people also possess the vices of their class, a kind of petty envy or familiarity, and finally, a cold-eyed resentment which finds expression in an attempt to annihilate or pull down whatever is exceptional, whatever stands above the mediocre. Nietzsche has some critical words for the objective spirit in philosophy and in scholarship. The purely objective man, to the extent that he realizes his ideal, becomes a kind of mirror. He, he empties himself completely and simply reflects whatever is in front of him. He submits himself to the reality that he is studying, and in doing this, he minimizes himself and his own role in the entire project of knowing. There is little love and little hatred in him. He has become an instrument rather than a philosopher, and so he cannot be an engine of culture, of value creation. He's not a goal. He has, in a sense, lost himself in his pursuit of this style of objective scholarship. Philosophers who reject skepticism are received with a kind of horror by the scholars of today, says Nietzsche, who see skepticism as a necessary corrective against the forces of nihilism and are very concerned about anyone who breaks with this party line. The skeptic, says Nietzsche, is a kind of delicate creature who flinches at anyone who says yes or no too forcefully. Of course, that is Nietzsche and the Nietzschean philosopher of the future that he's thinking of there. Nietzsche diagnoses this attraction to skepticism as the spiritual effect of a kind of physiological nervous exhaustion, which he thinks is a reaction to this long-time mixing of values and lineages in the European consciousness. The will gradually atrophies, and these scholars, skeptical scholars, take no pleasure in willing. Nietzsche observes that this is not a geographically evenly spread phenomenon, that this particular kind of atrophy is most advanced in France, least advanced in Russia. He speaks a bit about national characters here and suggests that the 20th century will bring a fight for the dominion over the earth between these different nations that have these different levels of atrophy of spirit. Nietzsche also praises, by contrast, the spiritualized skepticism of the Emperor Frederick the Great. 
In the final sections of part six, Nietzsche turns towards describing the character of this philosopher of the future, which he's referred to throughout this work. The philosopher of the future will be a critic. He will be an experimenter, an attempter of new things, focused upon experience. He will have a certain kind of level-headed cruelty. He will seem to be harder than his contemporaries, and he will wield a subtle knife. He will be disciplined and severe with himself. Nietzsche notes that there is an element of critique or criticism in this type of philosophy, but it is an instrument rather than being the whole of philosophy. And he specifically names here Kant as the one he is uh, contrasting this system with. Nietzsche contrasts genuine philosophers with what he calls philosophical laborers. The genuine philosopher works to create values out of his will to power. He has this sort of higher synthesis that he is uh, trying to achieve. Philosophical laborers, men especially like Kant, are mere instruments for the genuine philosophers to accomplish their task. They, they lack ambition uh, in a certain sense. The genuine philosopher, whom Nietzsche says will be a man of tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, practices an intellectual vivisection of the values of today. He cuts these things apart while they are alive. He diagnoses the moral psychology of his contemporaries in order to uncover a new greatness in man. And he finds this greatness in his own range and multiplicity and the strength of his will. The identity of a philosopher, Nietzsche says, cannot be taught but must be learned from experience. One cannot be trained into this, one must discover it. Modern philosophers have fallen into the trap of regarding thought as a kind of toilsome work, as something grave and serious, rather than something light-hearted something like dancing. There is an order of rank among the different states of the soul, Nietzsche says in conclusion, and it's one's place in this order of rank that determines the problems that one can confront. The genuine philosopher, the philosopher of the future, will be the result of many generations worth of preparation. And here, perhaps again, we see a return of Nietzsche's Lamarckism. That brings us to the end of part six of Beyond Good and Evil. We'll talk about part seven next. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye.